Welcome everybody, Steve. Back again with Friar Anthony. Thank you, Friar, for being here. Yeah, thank you. And we were talking last week about doing a little show on the Miraculous Medal since he piqued my interest again during a Colby uh, consecration lecture series he did when he talks about this conversion of Alphonse Radisburn. And he also mentioned another guy we may get into later, but we're going to focus on this. First off, Friar, what is the Miraculous Medal? What did St. Colby think about it? And why is it so powerful? The Miraculous Medal, um, it came it came from the apparition that happened at Rudabach from St. Catherine Labore. So St. Catherine Labore, now the, the dates are very important. This happened in 1830. In 1830, there were three apparitions that happened to St. Catherine in the second apparition. The first one's very, it's a very sweet apparition because, you know, she gets led there by this little, this little angel or something, and, and, and Our Lady sitting, actually sitting there in a chair. You can hear her, her gown ruffling, and Saint Catherine just goes up, and kneels there, and puts her hands on Our Lady's lap. And it's a very beautiful, very, very sweet apparition that, that took place. Then in the second one, Our Lady appears above the altar, and there's a, uh, she's standing on the globe, and that globe is encircled by the serpent. And her foot, her immaculate foot, is crushing the head of the serpent, uh, which is the film, fulfillment of the prophecy of Genesis 3.15. And then her hands are extended towards the earth, and there are rays coming down as though out of her hands, but really from rings that are on her fingers. And those rays are coming down to the earth, and they're widening as they come towards the earth. And then there's a then later she sees coming around Our Lady, it's the words, Oh, Mary conceived without sin. Um, and then on the back of the image, you have, I've got a big miraculous medal here. You probably can't see it from the glow. And we see cross, and there's the M with the bar going across. And so it shows that the M's for Our Lady and the cross is for Our Lord, the redemption. There's a bar that connects them and interweaves Our Lady always in the mystery of redemption uh, and, and the mission of redemption of our Lord. And so it, just below that, you have the two hearts. You have the sacred heart, and that's encircled in, with the crown of thorns for the suffering that our Lord endured. And then you got the immaculate heart right next to our Lord um, with, a, with a sword plunged into our heart from the prophecy of Simeon, the, from the, all the sorrows of Our Lady. Uh, being that she 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 assisted and participated in in this redemption as it was prophesied in um, in Genesis three fifteen, Our Lady promised in that apparition that anyone who would wear that medal, well, first told Saint Catherine to have it struck, but that anyone who would wear that medal, a blessed medal, and wear it around their neck would receive many graces. Now, of course, these were the graces that were symbolized from the rays of light that were coming from her rings. Now, there were a couple of rings that didn't have any light that was emitting from them. And St. Catherine asked about those. And the response was, those are all the graces that men do not ask me for, which is a very interesting thing. That means we ask, Our Lady is the mediatrix of all graces. She, she gives all graces. God does not grant grace except through the Blessed Virgin Mary. That's a fact. In the church, it's just not dogmatically established. Mm -hmm. You read the fathers of the church, you read the saints, everyone has almost always believed this. All graces come through Our Lady. The John Scotus goes so far to think that in some capacity, these, these graces belong to Our Lady. Now, they're, they're all the graces that are merited by our Lord on the cross, so they're His graces. But, be, and this is, it gets complicated. I know we're not talking about this because we could go on for another hour about Our Lady, Spouse, the Holy Spirit, why it is that she receives these graces. Um, but in a way, in St. Saint, Saint Maximilian Colby talks about this, but really piggybacking on um, St. Louis de Montfort about the fact that Our Lady, her Immaculate Heart, is the external manifestation of the Holy Ghost. So, it's a magnificent thing to say. What it means is the Holy Ghost He's the center and he's the soul that is of the church. That he's he's the love of the Holy Trinity 
and in and, and the love is is what you're responsible for the sanctification and that's what our lord meant when he said i will send you know you want me to go to the father so i will send the paraclete well the holy ghost doesn't do anything except for through the, his his holy spouse he wants to manifest his goodness all through her she's the external manifestation in that sense of of the holy spirit so these graces as blessed john Duns scotus talks about in some capacity they are hers to distribute as she likes now we got to remember that our lady only does god's will she's so perfectly conformed to god she could never do anything but god's will anything but god's will would seem to her the most putrative uh, of things you could imagine so only God's will. That, that, that is the only thing that would make sense to her. So God gives her these graces, meaning these graces that when they're needed, especially like uh, accidental graces or transitory graces, he goes so far to say that, you know, I think this is speculation, but that they're created in her will. They're created in, because they have to be created somewhere, but they're created in the Immaculate Virgin, and so she dispenses them as, as she sees fit. That is, perfectly according to the will of God, because that's what the Blessed Virgin Mary, mm -hmm. that's what she does. So that you have these graces, and so we ask her for these graces, and those graces come down uh, in that way. And this is an instrument. So why the Miraculous Medal? The Miraculous Medal, because Our Lady wants to, she wants some means. She wants to say, here is a tool, here's an instrument by which I want to communicate the graces that are given me to give to you. It, it's just another way of, of trying to help us to receive those graces. It's a mother's attention to us as she, she's always trying to prepare us and uh, bring us closer to her son and, and provide for us the redeeming grace that our Lord won for us on the cross because we squander that stuff. But a mother doesn't want as she sat there and suffered, that it, it's in that moment of suffering at the foot of the cross where we become her children. That is in in uh, in Revelation 12 when it talks about, and she brought forth the man child in pain, in in in, uh, in tribulation, right? But that's us. That wasn't our Lord. That was us that she she suffered pain with. So the miraculous medal is an instrument. It's an instrument by which Our Lady grants us graces. For those who wear a blessed medal around their neck faithfully, right? Well, that happened in 18, that happened in 1830. Already by 1832, um, it had been struck and they started to give these out to people. But I think it was 1832 that an epidemic hit in France, especially in Paris, that about 20,000 people died. Well, they immediately distributed 2,000 medals. And they were able to see right away all kinds of miracles started to happen. People started to get cured, and the epidemic started to subside. And this is a cholera epi epidemic. It was the people at France that started to refer to this medal, the Medal of the Immaculate Conception. That's what the medal is. Its official name is the Medal of the Immaculate Conception. Even in the, the Roman ritual, it says Medal of the Immaculate Conception, or by common usage, the Miraculous Medal mm -hmm. is what it says. And so it was in Paris what they started to refer to it as the miraculous medal. Now, in, in, in Rome, around this time, especially at the time of Alphonse Radisbon, which was in 1841, is a, really it was 1842, um, very beginning of 1842, when Alphonse Radisbon makes it to, to the city of Rome. During that time, there's already a bunch of French exiles basically that are living there because you remember all the all the um all the revolutions that were taking place and catholics were displaced especially anybody that was of kind of nobility or in the government they they had to flee if they were good catholics they had to flee and rome at that point in time was still was still run by the pope the pope still had all the papal states and that means he was the king of that area but he was very open to allowing to any of the, uh, this is Pope, Pope Pius IX, the blessed Pope Pius IX, very holy and a very, very great. Uh, he was the longest reigning pontiff and probably one of the most holiest. Uh, he, he was a very holy man. It's a shame he's not a saint yet, but there's other reasons for that and we're not going to go into that. So during that time, 
Alphonse was on a journey, right? When I just finished the thought there. So this is why you have the miraculous medal there. You've got Frenchmen who have already seen the power of it there in France, but already within five years of its, of its being struck, already 10 million had been distributed. And by 16, I think it was like 76 or something, whenever St. Catherine Labore died, already a billion medals had been given out. That's a lot. I mean, for, for the 1800s, it's a lot to strike that many medals and to hand them all out. A billion medals had already been distributed. It was a very popular medal of Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception. Now, remember, this is also before, it's, it's normal for us to think, yeah, the Immaculate Conception, I mean, we're all on board. Well, it hadn't been defined yet. It wasn't defined until 1854. So this was in the 1830s, well before uh, the, the Immaculate Conception became just a common thing. Even today, I, I had one catechist when I was, I went down to talk about Our Lady to a group of, a group of kids at the local parish here. It was a CCD class or something. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know what the kids are at the local CCD classes. They really don't know a whole lot, nor do the teachers. But they asked me to come down and talk about Our Lady. So I started to talk about Our Lady. And I realized nobody knew anything. But one of the teachers piped up and said, when I asked, so do you know what the Immaculate Conception is? The teacher said, yeah, that's when, uh, that's when Our Lady gave birth to Jesus. And I looked at the teacher and said, no. <laughs> I was like, what, what am I supposed to say? Let's I mean, try what, again. <laughs> so, Two for three. <laughs> that's right. So, so it, you know, even today, we don't, we don't know a whole lot about it. Oh, at least a lot of Catholics don't. So back then, before it was even defined, how many people talked about, how many lay people were around talking about the Immaculate Conception? But I think lay people had always known it. It really came from the people. The church had always known she was immaculate. So that's where we get these Frenchmen there at, at Rome with, with these medals. Now, Alphonse... Being you a Franciscan, you guys have been celebrating that long before the definition, right? The Immaculate Conception really... St. Saint, Saint Francis himself, there's a couple of different things. St. Francis himself, um, first he gave us this prayer, uh, Ave Domina, and we say it every morning at breakfast when we finish our meal. Uh, it's a beautiful little prayer, but it just talks about, it, it's a prayer that, um, it just talks about really the great dignity of Our Lady. And then even St. Francis in his own lifetime, when I think it was at Rieti, I can't remember, but he was in like northern kind of northeastern Italy preaching. And there he raised money. He begged money to build a church. And in that church, he built an altar dedicated to the Immaculate Conception. That was St. Francis. He built, a, he, he, he built an altar dedicated to the Immaculate Conception. So it, it's very much a part of the Franciscan. This comes down through, we, we refer to it as the Franciscan dogma because it was, it was the Franciscans who fought tooth and nail and never once they, they had never, we had never not believed that Our Lady was immaculately conceived. Mm -hmm. The big war between war, it was a, um, a debate between the Franciscans and the Dominicans all the way up until the dogmatic pronouncement. They say that the, the, the Dominicans, God bless them, uh, I mean, following the line of thought from, from Thomas, because Thomas did not believe that Our Lady was immaculately conceived. He worked it out based on, based on the science and the the theology, basically, of, of Aristotle or the philosophy of Aristotle. And so is it just a different way to approach it? And so it was wrong. Uh, but Blessed John Duns Scotus was able to arrive at it in a way where he could he easily proved it was it was uh, it was obvious that Our Lady was conceived without sin. So that that debate came all the way down to right before the pronouncement, 1854, where the Dominicans had an all night vigil praying that the Pope wouldn't make this mistake. <laughs> So thankfully he made the mistake and, and he he defended the faith. So uh, so yes, it, it comes down from the Franciscan school uh, of thought. I mean, that's where you get poor Clares that were conceptionists. Conceptionists on Mary of Agreda, conceptionists none. They they believed in the Immaculate Conception. Uh, and I could go on and on, but we're talking about Alphonse, right? Yes. So who is this Alphonse guy? Who is this Alphonse guy? So Alphonse Rat Alphonse Radisbon was an atheist Jew. Now, forgive me, anybody who's going to watch this and think I'm being rude by saying Jew, but being a Jew means you're part of a nation. That, that's what they're, they're Jewish. So it's not in any way to say anything bad about him. Our Lord was a Jew. Our Lady was a Jew. This isn't, we're not being, 
we're not we're not being this is degraded. A description. It's a word you use for a, a, a people with a certain nationality. Mm -hmm. They were of a bloodline, and they still are today. Well, Alphonse was an atheist Jew. Uh, he he didn't. I mean, he liked the cultural aspect of it and the nationalistic. Uh, you know, they 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 identified with it, but he didn't believe anything. He was an enlightened. You know, especially that time period. And it comes down to us today, especially in the progressive side of things, the liberal, the kind of the liberal people. Mm -hmm. It's all about, uh, you know, we, it's, we don't buy into superstition. That's what kind of this illuminated mindset is. Alphonse was that way. He came from a really good family. The Strasburgs. The Strasburgs are one of those financial families, uh, very wealthy, very influential. Uh, his life was made. He was 28 years old, and he was espoused to his niece. That sounds gross to us, but back then, I guess, I don't know. But he was espoused to his niece, but she was – not of marrying age yet. And so in waiting to espouse his beloved niece and start his life in this job with his uncle in, you know, uh, this very wealthy business that they had, his life was set. But he was going to spend a year just waiting so he could espouse his, his bride. And so he went on a long journey. It was going to be a whole year. And first, and so he found himself at the end of, well, kind of around the end of 1841, he found himself in Palermo and he was getting ready to take off to go to Sicily. And then he was going to go to Malta and then he was going to head off to uh, Constantinople. And that was going to make up the rest of his year. Sitting on beaches and just kind of living the high life. But as he was in Palermo, that's down in Naples, he got this, he got this, this longing to go to Rome. He thought, well, I'm here now. And once I go back and get married and start my work, I'll never come back here again. I know it. So I better go visit Rome. So he got a ticket and he went for a fortnight. So for 14 days, two weeks, he went to Rome and just went around to visit all the churches, looked at all the artwork, went to the museums and just tried to cram a bunch of stuff in his head. You know, on the very last night of his trip there in Italy, when he had to head back to Palermo in Naples, to where he's going to get on a boat, I guess, and start heading over to Sicily, uh, heading east, as he says. He wanted to call on an old friend. Now, here, I'm going to give you a couple names. So he, he was going to call on a friend named uh, Gustave, Gustave uh, Bassier. Now, I'm most likely getting the names wrong because I, I don't know how to say these names in French. I mean, these are French names. And they have, they have these endings that I'm sure you're not supposed to say, but I have no clue how to say them. So somebody's going to be watching this say, you don't say it. Well, I don't know how to say it. So I'm just going to say it a certain way, and I'll try to be consistent so we know kind of who the characters are. So Gustav was the brother. Anyways, Gustav was a good friend of his, but he was a Protestant. He, was, he had, a, uh, I don't know, some kind of Protestantism. And these two would get in. They were school friends. And they would get in debates, and their debates would get pretty heated, and they would end with calling each other names. Uh, the Protestant would call him a callous Jew and he would call his friend a fanatic Protestant and then they would leave and, but they were still friends. Well, he was at Rome somehow. And so Al Alphonse went to pay him a visit the night before he's going to leave. He didn't find him at home. So he went to his brother's house. Gustav had his brother, Theodore Boussier, who lived nearby, I guess. And he went just to leave a note for that family because he had met Gustav's brother, Theodore uh, before, but they didn't, they weren't friends. They really didn't know each other more than just having a conversation. Mm -hmm. Went to the house, knocked the door. The Italian, the Italian servant lady came and he wanted to leave a note with her, but she didn't understand. So she ushered him in to the drawing room, as they say, and that's where the family was all uh, seated and enjoying their Saturday afternoon or Saturday evening. And this greatly irritated Alphonse because he didn't want to sit down and talk to this family because they were Catholic. And he had a deep hatred for Catholics, Alphonse did. Fifteen years earlier, Alphonse's brother had converted to the faith and became a Catholic priest. And that really, that was, and Alphonse persecuted him for it. He hated him outright for it, wouldn't speak to him. And he, pers he says in his own words, I persecuted him for it. So he sat down. You remember Alphonse is a he's a sophisticated man. He, he comes from a cultured family and he sits down and him and Theodore Boussier with his family present. They exchange civil pleasantries. 
and they, they just kind of talk about things that are on a pretty superficial level until Theodore, who's a good Catholic, he's actually, he was actually a, a convert from Protestantism. He starts digging in a little bit more, looking for, you know how good Catholics, they, they get tired of talking about this petty stuff. So they want to dig a little bit more. You're at Rome. What else have you seen? What else did you do? Mm -hmm. So Alphonse, he mentions, well, when I was at Araceli, at Araceli, it's a, actually a Franciscan church. It's an ancient, I mean, the Franciscans already had that church, I think, in the, during the life of St. Francis, but it's on the Capitoline Hill. It's where the capital is. It used to be a papal building, uh, papal palace, but they took it. Mm -hmm. Now they have, you know. So anyways, it's, it's a church. It's way up on top of this hill. Really old church. Lots of saints buried there. It's a, it's a magnificent place. When he was in there, uh, he said this. I have a quote, and I'll read it to you. A rather odd thing happened to me. While I was looking over the church, I felt myself suddenly seized with an, an emotion for which I could assign no cause. The valet de place, I guess just the, you know, the usher, whoever was there to take care of the door, seeing my agitation, asked me what was the matter and whether I would go out into the open air, adding that he had often seen strange simil, simmer, uh, similarly, a, a stranger similarly affected. Very interesting. Now, this, this Araceli, it's a church dedicated to Our Lady. Uh, and when he was in there, he just, you know, he visited all kinds of churches. When he was in this church dedicated to Our Lady, he got very emotional and he didn't know what to do about it. Now, hearing that, the good friend, uh, this is Theodore Boussier, he kind of has a sparkle in his eye. This is the way he writes. He says he has a sparkle in his eye. And so Alphonse notices it. But Theodore thinks in, at this moment, He's going to be a Catholic. He will be a Catholic. And Alphonse, thinking, this is what he's probably thinking, starts to scoff at it. Now, Alphonse was a scoffer. He was one of those scoffers they talk about in Scripture. And so he scoffed at the whole idea and said, I, I was born a Jew and I will die a Jew. And then later, he says, he went, went down, he walked through the, the Jewish ghetto, and it just confirmed his hatred for the faith and everything else. So at that with this 28 year old Strasbourg young man who's there, who knows everything and is sure of everything, completely sure of himself, Theodore proposes a challenge to him. And he, he says, if I offer you something and ask you to wear it, because you're so sure of yourself, will you wear it? And so Alphonse starts to scoff again. He says, what is this thing? You know, what is the, let me see this thing you want me to wear. And um, He shows him the medal, the Blessed Virgin Mary. So the miraculous medal and he hands it to him. And Alphonse scoffs and just says, what? And, and so the Theodore says, well, if, if you're so sure of yourself, it's nothing for you. It's just a medal. It's just a trinket. Just wear it. And it'll make, it'll, it'll please me greatly if you would wear this. Please just, just wear it. And so he says, fine, I'll, I'll, I will take your challenge. I will wear your, I will wear your, your silly little medal or whatever. And then the good friend, and this is a, this is a lesson to us that we, we should push sometimes because we don't push. We, 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 we bow down to human respect. We hear Theodore, he goes a bit further and he says, and could I ask you also to say this prayer? And he gives him the prayer, the Memorari. And he, you know, oh Mary conceived without sin, pray for us through every course to thee. Uh, and he says, oh, I mean, this is too much. You're asking me to say this prayer too. He said, well, it's nothing for you. The prayer, it would mean a lot to me. The prayer doesn't mean anything to you. Wear the medal, say the prayer. He's like, fine, I'll say your prayer. And could you also write it down because it's my only copy? And, and he's like, oh, you, you're unbearable. You, you, you just don't even know where to stop. He's like, fine, I will write it down. But you, I will keep your copy and you will take my copy. So that's how he makes off with it. And he leaves there mumbling like these impossible people, something like that. So, so they get, anyways, they, so he, he leaves and that's Saturday night. This Sunday, is the first night, right? This is the first night they said. That was the first night they met. Now, Alphonse is supposed to leave sat Sunday evening. So this is the night before he's supposed to leave. And Theodore goes and pays a visit to him, wherever his house, his apartment was, and leaves a little note saying, would you please meet me tomorrow at 10 o'clock? And he does. Alphonse comes and he meets him promptly at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. And um, they, they talk again and go visit a couple of places, more scoffing and whatever else. It had no impact. But Theodore's being pretty open now, saying that I will have, you will, you know, you you will convert to the faith. And Alphonse is laughing at him, saying that wouldn't happen. 
But here's where the Theodore, the good friend, goes even further. He says, you, you have to stay. You can't get on, you can't get on that, um, you can't get on the coach and go back to Palermo. You, you have to stay here. And Alphonse said, absolutely not. He's like, I'm going to be on the, on the beaches of Malta. I, I'm, I'm not staying here another day. And he's like, no, I absolutely insist. I will not let you go. And he, he kind of takes him to the station and somehow gets Alphonse to change his ticket. I don't know if it was a week later, two weeks later, but he changes his ticket. And so he, Alphonse follows suit and changes the ticket. So that ends that evening. And that Saturday or Sunday evening, now Theodore has to go have dinner with somebody. He's, he parts ways with Alphonse. Now Theodore Boussier goes and has dinner with a good friend. Now the friend's name, which I'm sure I'm not saying it right, is uh, De La Freon. And he, he was a count and he worked in the government when he was in France. And he was older, but a very great piety, they said. He was a good Catholic. Well, they had a long discussion about Alphonse. And Lafreon offered and said that he would pray much for Alphonse Radispon. By Monday night, Lafreon was already dead. He had already died. Okay? So a couple days go by, and every day, now this good friend, Lafreon, he's dead. Boussier, I'm um, sorry, Theodore Boussier is good friends with him. It's like a family member who just died. Now he's split between seeking the conversion of Alphonse, which he had this internal impulse that he had to keep pursuing him like a hound. He had to, they talk about our Lord as the hound of heaven. He just had to constantly be tracking down this atheist Jewish young man to try to get him to convert. Um, and then he also felt he had these duties, these obligations, because his friend, his good dear friend had just died, and he wanted to be there to pray, and he wanted to console, he wanted to mourn himself, but he wanted to console the family. But even the priest that was there said, you need to go after this young man, so keep going, keep doing your work, do what you feel God's calling you to do. So he would go track down Alphonse Radisson, and they would keep, uh, he'd keep taking him around town. Well, Wednesday, I'll just jump to Wednesday, because they met Tuesday, and then on Wednesday, they meet again. And each day, Alphonse is scoffing, and he's saying he's blaspheming, and he's mocking the faith and everything else, which you can imagine is hard on somebody, because when we hear somebody scoffing and blaspheming, we want to shun them right away. But we have to also know where people are at. And so he's not a Catholic. He's doing this as someone who hates the faith. And so a good Catholic was there giving good Catholic example and trying to help him see the faith. So he didn't abandon him in that. Well, on Wednesday, they go to visit a couple of places. And one of those places was um, San, San Stefano Rotondo. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's a, it's a church. It's also up on one of the hills. It's on kind of the older part of Rome. It's close to where the house where St. Gregory the Great used to live and uh, some other real famous churches. But it's more wooded up in that area and things like that. It's kind of south of the, um, the uh, Colosseum. And so they go to San Stefano Rotondo, and it's a church. Rotondo's because it's in a circle, right? And on all the walls going all the way around the church are very graphic depictions of martyr, of the great famous martyrdoms that happened at Rome. And he takes Alphonse there, and Alphonse is pretty impressed with this. He thought it was gruesome and terrible, all these terrible ways that these Christians had died, but in the end justified it by saying, yeah, but the Jews have suffered a lot at the hands of the Christians. And he left it at that. So they left there and they went to, they walked up the hill and that leads you to St. Saint, uh, Saint John Lateran. And so he took him to St. John Lateran, the principal church of, the, of, of our holy faith. And in there, if anybody's been there, you see there's all the statues going down the main nave. And those are all the, all the apostles. And each one of those statues is holding the instrument of his death. Like you got St. Bartholomew who's holding his own skin because he was flayed alive. It's like over top of his arm. It's a pretty interesting statue. And these are huge statues. But above those statues are these reliefs, these base reliefs that depict on one side, the gospel side, um, fulfillments of prophecy from the Old Testament, but happened in the, in the New Testament. And then on the, the epistle side, you have the, the fulfillment of those New Testament um, fulfillments. I'm sorry, the, 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 the figures of those New Testament fulfillments. And they come down. You know, going across the aisle, so you can you can look across and see. That's what that's what happened. The flood happened. This is what happened 
the fulfillment in the faith, crucifixion this is what happened. So you see these things in the church. It's very apologetic. It's, it's very catechetical. And so he took him there and Alphonse was pretty interested. He thought that was pretty interesting. Now, this is somebody who's never, he, it was later attested to that he never read more than two pages of the whole Bible. Now his, his brother said that about, him. Mm-hmm. um, so from there, they're walking out of St. John Lateran, and right across the street from St. John Lateran is the Scala Santa. That's the, the Holy Stairs mm-hmm. where, that our Lord climbed up where Pontius Pilate was the St. Helena brought back from Jerusalem. Um, they stopped right in front of the Holy Stairs, and this is where the brother – I have a quote. Let's see if I can find the quote real quick. So uh, not, not the brother, but Theodore – Theodore stops there, and he just says, Hail, Scala Santa. Hail, Holy Stairs. Here is a man who will one day ascend you on his knees. Because there, there was this rivalry going on. I wouldn't say it's holy, but it was a rivalry because it was holy on the part of Theodore Boussier because he was he's challenging openly this guy, saying, you will become Catholic. And then you got the, the, the atheist Jew there saying, this is nonsense. You know, this is absolute nonsense that only superstitious, you know, old ladies do this kind of stuff. Um, and here's the prophecy. The ve- so that's, that's Wednesday, probably late afternoon. Uh, the next morning, Alphonse goes to Piazza Spagna. That's where the, um, the Spanish stairs are. That's where that column is with the, the beautiful statue of the Immaculate Conception. The Pope goes to every year at the time of um, the Immaculate Conception and leave, leaves flowers and gives a little talk and things like that. It's a beautiful thing. Well, there's a lot of cafes there and whatever. So that morning, Thursday morning, Alphonse goes to some different cafes and gets, he's reading the paper. He's, he's engaging in conversation. We have the testimony from the people who he met with in those mornings and the frivolous, non-essential things that they were talking about. And Theodore makes an interesting point in the book. He said, if anybody would have said to him, in two hours, you will be a devout Catholic, he would have just scoffed at it because he was blaspheming all the way up. Well, close to, uh, it, it, you know, it's just, you, you take one of the roads at a diagonal from Piazza Spagna, and you find yourself, there's a little church tucked in a corner there. It's on the corner of two streets. And it's called San Andre delle Frati, delle Frate. And it's a church run by the minimums of St. Francis Paola. A church is of no significance. It really doesn't have anything in it that's really worth seeing. It's got a couple of statues that were carved by um, Bernini that didn't make the cut for whatever he was doing something for. And they're in there in the church. But there's no reason really to visit the church unless you're just walking by and you say, hey, what's in there? So they met, he's walking over towards the church and he runs into Theodore Boussier. And that was a church where Mr. Le- Laferron La was in the sacristy reposed and they were going to have the funeral the next day or something like that. And so Theodore Boussier had to go in there and do some arrangements for the, uh, the funeral, take about 10 minutes. In the meantime, Alphonse Radis Bond is just kind of walking around the church. It's a small church. It's not very large. And he was on the epistle side. So that means he's on the right side of the church, just looking at some things. And he says he remembers a dog. He doesn't remember anything. He doesn't remember anybody else being there, but he remembers some dog jumping around him. And next thing you know, he's on the complete other side of the church, the nave. And now he's on the gospel side of the church, which is on the left side. And he's before an altar. And on this altar, there's a magnificent light coming from this altar. And on that altar, which I, it's an altar of St. Michael, St. Michael the Archangel, that altar is. Now when you go, there's a picture of what Alphonse Radisbon saw. He saw Our Lady. But he looked up and he saw the Blessed Virgin Mary in all of her splendor uh, there before him. And he says, she made a sign to me that I was to kneel down. And to be quiet. And he did that. And he says something like, and she seemed very happy about that or very content or something. She didn't say anything to him. And what he says, uh, she said nothing, yet I knew everything. She infused the Holy Catholic faith from those great, those, ra- those rays coming from those rings because she was wearing, he was wearing that medal. She infused the fullness of the faith 
and Alfondrada spawn. He tried three times to look up at her, and he couldn't do it. He kept trying, but she was so resplendent. He, he found he could only lift his eyes as far as her hands. He could lift his eyes as far as her hands and see the, the graces flowing out on him, but he couldn't look up at her anymore. He kept trying and couldn't do it. Now, you can imagine the surprise when Theodore comes out of the sacristy, comes out of the sacristy, and there's Alphonse prostrate on the floor weeping. So he goes up and he taps him a couple times. He's like, Alphonse, Alphonse, Alphonse. And finally, Alphonse comes to the senses and he says, take me out of here. You got to get me out of here. And he's weeping and he's muttering things like, how beautiful, well, how beautiful, you know, he's saying all these things that they don't make any sense. So Theodore basically carries him out of the church and outside Alphonse is a complete disaster. I mean, he's, he's overcome with joy and can't stop weeping. He keeps saying beautiful things about the faith and about the, the truth of the faith and, and how, how silly he was and how beautiful it all is. And, but he keeps weeping and, Finally, Theodore, he doesn't know what's going on. He's like, do I need to get a doctor? And, what's, and he says to him, you know, please tell me something. He's like, I need to see a confessor because what I have to say can only be said kneeling. So he knew he had to, he, he had to, he, he, what he had just experienced was so beautiful. He could only explain it to somebody on his knees and it had to be a priest. <laughs> what happened? How do you know that has to be a priest? How do you know it has to be me kneeling? But he also knew that in the church, the Blessed Sacrament was there, and it was an awful thing, he said, to not be baptized and to be in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament. That's what he said. You know, Now, God forbid we say it, but that's what he said. So you think it'd be, he'd be upset about talking inside the church now? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. He became a priest, though. Yeah, so... Right after that, what happened was he was he was already baptized. I think it was on the Jan. So this was in this all happened. Um, it would have been January. Maybe it was the 17th or 18th, something like that. It was like it was the middle of January. Mm -hmm. And by January 30th, 31st was his baptism. Now, normally you had to wait a year, two years. He went to meet with a priest. So they went down to visit the priest at uh, Chiesa di Gesù. That's the Jesuit church, a beautiful mural of people being cast out of heaven into hell. That's because after the Protestant Revolution, Reformation, that, 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 that's the artwork that's on the, the ceiling there. It's magnificent. They went there and met with a good priest. And... The priest was able to get, he listened to him for a long time, was able to get a bit out of him. But Alphonse really had a hard time because it was such an emotional thing that he just would weep between like every other word. Um, so they decided, let's go give thanks for this. And they went and visited uh, St. Peter's and then uh, St. Mary Major and a couple other churches. But at St. Peter's, they went in, at St. Peter's, they have a chapel there where the Blessed Sacrament is reserved. And they went in there and Saint or uh, Alphonse Radisbon felt he felt overcome with dread, and it was the fact that he wasn't baptized. He he felt he felt he couldn't sustain the presence, the Almighty presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, and so he, he would almost faint being in the presence of the of the Blessed Sacrament, and so he would ask to be taken away from there because he couldn't he couldn't handle it. Because he knew he wasn't baptized. He couldn't, he wanted baptism immediately, but he couldn't sustain that presence. So they took him to the chapel of the Blessed Virgin. Now, this is St. Peter's. I don't know what chapel they're talking about. I mean, our chapels, I don't know if that means the chapel right across the, the nave dedicated to the Immaculate Conception, which has now a gate in front of it. Maybe it didn't have a gate before, but that's where the choir is and the, the canons of the cathedral, not the cathedral, but of St. Peter's. They go to, um, the chant their office. I don't know if that's the chapel they mean, but one of the chapel of the Blessed Virgin at St. Peter's, they went there and he said, here, I feel, I feel completely consoled. Whenever he was around Our Lady, he felt, there was only what he said, there's only mercy here. It's beautiful. That's a beautiful thought. Yeah, I remember reading about him just, when you talk about him crying, he was kissing the medal and thanking Our Lady repeatedly. Yeah. 
That's right. When he ran into her, when, when, when he came out, the way he explained it, he just kept kissing the metal. That was the, the, to show what had just happened when he took him out of the, out of the church. So. And long story short, he became a evangelist for the Jews, right? The, yeah, so he got baptized, and it, just on a quick note, his baptism was was quite a quite a splendid thing. You can still get the book Alphonse the conversion of Alphonse Bond. It was written by his friend, the Theodore Boussier, the one who gave him the medal. But they recount the baptism. Now, when this happened, when this conversion happened, it immediately spread like wildfire all through Rome, and the people at Rome were so edified by the fact that this had happened that Our Lady would do something so beautiful that a lot of the faithful packed that church for that baptism. And they saw this, this young 28 year old man who was very, you know, he was still in his, his prime in a white robe. He was very proud just two weeks earlier. He was very proud. Now he, they, they refer to him as this docile little lamb and he's kissing the ground and they're doing all the things that the baptism requires. But the really beautiful thing was when he went up to receive the Blessed Sacrament for the first time, as he approached, because he, he had the knowledge of the faith, faith infused into him. It's different than us. We believe. But he had that full knowledge infused into him. And we don't know exactly what that means, but he had a different kind of belief. And so when he approached the altar for the first time with our Lord during Mass to receive it to communion rail, he, he could barely, they had to carry him there and support him. It was the good priest who catechized him and a sponsor. They had to support him there so he could receive the Blessed Sacrament. When he received it, he was so, he was so emotionally overcome that his body like stopped functioning, that he couldn't walk. They had to carry him back. He was, he was sobbing with, 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 with great tenderness and joy from, from this union of receiving our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. So in that, uh, shortly after, he was able to enter into the Jesuits, and then he became a priest, and him and his brother, uh, Theodore uh, uh, Radisbon, they both went to Jerusalem where they, they, they worked for the conversion of the Jews. And that's the, that's the life of Alphonse Radisbon. Yeah, there's a, I, I first read about this in the book uh, by, I think it was Catherine Laboray's confessor that wrote the book on the history of Miraculous Metal trying to get it republished and uh that's just one of many uh stories but i this is the most famous isn't there one in the united states that happened in the was it the 60s or 50s yeah it happened in the 20s 20s newman claude newman and I've, I've i've encouraged people before to go on pilgrimage there but then they said oh, excuse me friar have you ever seen the church <laughs> so, no i've never seen the church but so maybe it's not the best place to go on pilgrimage, but it's a really interesting story. It happened in Mississippi and it was a black man. And I haven't sorted out all the details exactly um, if he was guilty or not guilty, but his mother or his grandmother, uh, her husband, I think it was like a second husband or something like that was abusing her. I don't know if he was beating her or what, but Claude, I think had enough of it. And I think he may have killed the guy. I don't know if it's accidentally or intentionally. But regardless, being a black man in Mississippi in the 20s, you know, you didn't have a, even now you see that there's a, there's a famous case right now in Georgia with that, that young man that was jogging through a neighborhood. I mean, you still see sometimes things aren't working out so well uh, with, uh, with the white black uh, situation in some of these states. But so Claude went to jail. And he was going to be on death row. And he was on death row. And there was another death row inmate there. And Claude, and the, the, the death row inmate there was like Irish Catholic, white Irish Catholic. But he had a medal of the Blessed Virgin, a little one around his neck. And Claude liked it. He just asked. He just said, what's that around your neck? And this, this um, bad Catholic that was on death row there, he just rips it off, says some blasphemy, and throws it on the ground so you can take it. Claude picks it up. And he cherished it, you know, Claude thought this was very, it was a very nice medal. Well, that night, that night, this beautiful woman appears to him while he's sleeping. I don't say in a dream, but while he's sleeping, comes to his bedside and Claude looks at her and he's, you know, he doesn't know whether to be afraid because it's a, 
an apparition, uh, like a ghost, or you know, or just to be in complete awe because it's the most beautiful thing he's ever seen before. And all of this, uh, this beautiful lady said was, if you want me to be your mother and you to be my son, call for a Catholic priest. And so she went away and he scrambled for a Catholic priest. And this good Catholic priest came and there's a lot of stuff that happened and I won't go into all of it. I encourage anybody to go and learn about Claude Newman, but that Catholic priest was Father O'Leary, something like that. Uh, he was in the, what would it would have been the first world war. And in that world war, when he was in Belgium or something like that, he was in a foxhole and he promised our lady, if you get me through this, I'm going to build a church in your honor. Well, Claude said to the priest, our lady told me to tell you, if you didn't believe me, that you made her a promise that you were going to build that church and you still haven't built that church. And Claude was very simple. He was very simple, very honest. In fact, every quote that we have of Claude's, there's such clarity, but there's such simplicity in what he says. It's absolutely brilliant the way he, he says things about the faith. Because our lady, our lady started to catechize Claude. So father had to go and catechize Claude because Claude had asked to be baptized from, you know, this, what happened with the miraculous medal. And uh, so father Leary, he's going there and he brought two sisters with him to help with the catechism. And a couple of inmates also wanted to be catechized. So I think there's two others. So there's three of them total, if I'm not mistaken. And um, they would go on to something about, uh, let me read to you one here. I have one. I just pulled this thing up. Let me read you this. Claude said this. The priest is talking about the sacrament of confession. The sisters are talking about it. Okay, boys, today, this is what the sister said. The priest said, okay, boys, today, I'm going to teach you about the sacrament of confession. And here's what Claude said. Oh, I know about that. The lady told me that when you go to confession, we're kneeling down, not before a priest, but we're kneeling down before the cross of our son. And that, that when we are truly sorry for our sins and we confess our sins, the blood he shed flows down over us and washes us free of all our sins. And they're looking at this guy like, wow. <laughs> he didn't know anything about the faith. Just, that's, yeah, that's, that's right, Claude. <laughs> so let's see, there's, there's another one too. Oh, then, so then, because he boarded out like that, Claude said this, Oh, don't be angry. I didn't, uh, uh, don't be angry. Don't be angry. I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to blurt out. That's what, that's what Claude means. He was a real humble, beautiful soul. And so he also, our lady also told Claude that, um, when, when, when he goes to confession, it's kind of like a telephone. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you just, you're on the telephone with God and you're able to tell God everything, but through the, you can imagine our lady using this example of a telephone and talking to Claude and explaining it to him. So our lady catechized Claude and got him prepared for this. So now Claude becomes a Catholic. He got baptized maybe a couple of weeks before he's supposed to be executed. And you can find pictures of this. Claude, before he was to die, they asked him, and he had become very precious even to the uh, to all the inmates, but also very much to the um, the warden and them because he was a very sweet soul, you know, so they, they very much liked Claude. They were going to miss him and they felt bad they had to execute him now. But there was that one Catholic, that, that bad Catholic who ripped off the metal and threw it. He hated Claude. You can imagine, it pricked his conscience, but he hated Claude. So now it comes time for Claude's execution and they come to him and they say, what's your last request? And he said, well, everybody's real sad about this. And so I want to have a party so that everybody can, can celebrate a little bit and everybody can have some cake and whatever. So he, they have a party for everybody, for himself, but for everybody. And, and then Claude goes to execution day, but you see him before he kneels down. He says his very devout prayer before he goes out. Now it comes time for the execution close to it. And the warden barges in and says, there's been a stay of execution for two weeks. Claude breaks down in tears, uncontrollably weeping and saying, why? Why would, they, why would God do this to me? And the priest came over to console him and just said, said Claude, you know, you, you, you've, got, you've got to. And Claude's response was, if you had seen what I had seen, you'd want to die too. 
you'd want to die too. That that's that's another that's another teaching for us Catholics. We try to prolong our lives forever, and we we're so afraid to die. When what we have to look forward to, if we live for heaven, we get to see the Blessed Virgin and the Most Holy Trinity. But no, we want to stay here so we can go shopping and wear masks on our faces or whatever else. I was thinking of that P.O. line when uh, somebody was saying, uh, one of his one of the brothers said, hey, that's a beautiful statue. It's like the most beautiful statue they had at the, at the, at the, uh, at the wherever they were staying. And uh, he goes, she looks like that. I don't want to be there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then Claude, the way the priest decided to console Claude, he said, okay, Claude, I want you to offer these two weeks you're suffering for not being able to die right now. This is what's called suffering. I want you to offer the suffering of not being able to die for the conversion of that inmate that hates you. And Claude was like, yeah, I'll do that. So Claude offered all of his suffering, all of his prayers for that inmate. And then it came Claude's, in two weeks it came Claude's uh, execution day. And the secular journalists who were there write and testify to the fact they say never have we seen someone go to the electric chair so happy he died with a smile on his face that's incredible uh -huh. now the story gets better it comes time for the execution of that horrible catholic who was blaspheming all the way up to the point of the putting the mask on him where they're going to electrocute him and the priest came over and tried to hear his confession and he was blaspheming he tried to spit on the warden i mean it was there was no hope for this guy. So getting ready to put the mask on, he says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And he's looking up in the corner of the room. And he says, get me a priest, get me a priest. And I'm like, all right. So they went and got the priest is still there. So they got the priest that came over here, heard his confession. But the warden, his interest was, 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 uh, was perked, perked up. It'd been, uh, and so he went over and he said, all right, j j what happened? You were looking up there, you were blaspheming. What happened? I saw Claude, and behind him was the Blessed Virgin. And he obtained from the Blessed Virgin the grace that I would see my place in hell. <laughs> so that won for that. That This is an interesting point. It won for that, that, uh, that prisoner that was going to be executed. It won for him the grace to fear it was an imperfect contrition, right? Mm -hmm. But he had to confess to be able to be saved. Perfect contrition, you can't be saved by confession. And so there's a priest right there. Our Lady obtained for him imperfect contrition. He confessed, and he was executed, and he saved. Let's, I mean, we can pretty well presume. I mean, he didn't have anything to lose. I doubt he hit anything. Right. So Claude Newman. And you can still visit his grave. I've looked it up on Google. I'd love to go stop by there. It's in Mississippi and pray at his grave at some point in time. But hopefully someday there will be a cause for his beatification because – it just seems like um, he would be a beautiful saint, an American saint, to have risen to the altar here in America. Right. Especially in the least Catholic state in the United States of America. Oh, is that what it is? Mississippi's yeah. number one, or at least South Carolina's number two. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> I used to live in the second to least Catholic state in there. Mississippi's the only one I could pull that off. But, yeah, <laughs> I mean... No, prior that was awesome. I appreciate it. Uh, any other thoughts on the miraculous medal in general, or another, or any other story? Well, I will just say quickly. I know it gets long, and your listeners don't like to watch long things, but <laughs> who cares? I don't know. I mean, if they want to watch, they can watch it. But you said Max <laughs> Saint Maximilian Kolbe when he when he founded the MI, uh -huh. it was because he heard the story of Alphonse Radisson. There was two things that happened. He saw that um, that horrible procession it was the year it was a two-year anniversary 200 year anniversary of masons mm -hmm. i've seen a picture of it. They, they actually have a picture at the seraphic college that's the conventual college at rome um and the old refectory is a museum now it just has some things but they have a little picture and it has a picture of that procession i've looked i can't find anything like online or anything of that procession you can find other masonic processions but not the one that happened in rome that year but they walked right up to the front door with a banner that just with a Satan crushing the head of St. Michael, the archangel. And it said, Satan will rule in the Vatican. And they walked right out of the Pope's window, straight up to St. Peter's door. 
when he heard about that, he was indignant. Mm -hmm. And then the same year was the 75 anniversary, if I'm not mistaken, of Alphonse Radisbon's conversion. And so that that is what was the impetus for St. Maximilian Kolbe founding the militia of the Immaculata. Um, and so he used the miraculous medal as what he called bullets. Mm -hmm. And you know, the other saints have done it as well. But that's what it is. It just, Our Lady promised that's what it would be. It was an instrument that she wants to give to fight against as she crushes the head of the serpent. That was what's prophesied about Our Lady. She is the, the one who perfectly, the reason she's without sin is she perfectly assists our Lord in our redemption because our Lord asked for that and, and wanted her for that. Um, in, the, in the dogmatic, the bull of dogmatic definition, Pius IX refers to that they were written in one and the same decree. Um, um, anyways, the one and the same decree, which means our Lord, the decree that was written from all eternity for our Lord to come as our Redeemer, Our Lady was written in the exact same decree. Uno eodemque decretum. That, those are the words that the, the Pope uses. So she she's giving us a tool through the miraculous medal. It's a way that she crushes the head of the serpent. And what a, what a horrible way for somebody who's so proud to have their head crushed through a little medal. That's how powerful Our Lady is. He's just wear this medal, and that'll, well, I'll use that to crush his head. What a humiliation. So we, we should really go around and do, do our best, I think, to promote, to wear the miraculous medal. And you can get these. There's a, online, there's these Carmelites in Colorado. I would recommend they have some really nice, the bigger miraculous medals, and they're nickel-plated. They don't cost all that much. Those are really nice ones, um, from what I can tell. There's probably other places as well. I would encourage people, wear a large miraculous medal as a symbol of your consecration. If you're not consecrated to the Blessed Virgin Mary, you just need to do it. You need to, you need to become consecrated to her. And I would encourage the consecration prayer of, of St. Maximilian Kolbe, because it has the theology behind that consecration prayer is is based on the Immaculate Conception, where St. Louis de Montfort is not, because he's not coming from that theological framework, where St. Maximilian Kolbe is coming from that theological framework. It's not to diminish in any way the consecration of St. Louis de Montfort. That's not my intention. So and that's I would on your website. What's that? And that's on your website, right? Yeah, there's a there's a, the consecration prayers on the website. And then this year for the Novena for the Immaculate Conception, I gave a a nine day reflection mm -hmm. uh, in preparation for the Immaculate Conception, but, but to prepare people for consecration. So if they want, they're about 30 minutes long, each one. And then at the end, you have this um, consecration prayer, St. Maximilian. Um, and then I encourage you, invest in one of these beautiful medals and wear it around your neck. As always, I'll put the links underneath the videos in the uh, show notes description section. So yeah, if you can, if you send me the Colorado link, I don't didn't know about that group, but yeah, if you can send me if they have a website, I'll put that underneath there too. Okay, yep, I'll do it. Uh, so what you're saying is, get some medals, pass them out, and let the Immaculate take care of the rest. You know, I've found I've given medals to I give medals to people when I just go around walking. Mm -hmm. I already am strung and blessed, and I just hand them to them. And I've had people come back later, people that had no interest in the faith whatsoever. I don't know if they converted or not, but they would tell me how thankful they were of, of that medal. And they would even have relatives that would find me later and say how they talked about it. So, so some people, it may feel like, hey, we're just giving these trinkets out. And it doesn't mean, I've given the Protestant preachers before, you know, you never know what Our Lady's gonna do. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stories about people just seeing the medal on a table and not being able to take their eyes off of it. Our Lady can do what she wants. We simply wanna try to plant seeds and. Like St. Maximilian Colby says, hit him with a medal. Hit him with a, hit him with a bullet of Our Lady. Amen. Appreciate it. Well, Friar, thank you again, as always.